All right, guys. So what we have left for you is going to be the peak of the course right now. <laughs> this is going to be the, well, I wouldn't say the hardest part, but it's going to be the weirdest because this is going to be, of course, it's still electro, uh, it's like electricity and magnetism theory. So it's still some theory anyway, but this is going to be something that's like, I would say not, what you have experienced before in comparison to Newtonian physics, like uh, like uh, mechanics or thermodynamics or anything, because this is pretty much like your own imagination. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> the reason is because we already discussed about the electric field, electric potential, um, electric field lines and everything, right? Those are the stuff that physicists sort of invented and then used to visualize the electric effects. Okay. So we, I think I, I talked about this like a couple of times saying that electric field is not real. You cannot touch it. You cannot detect it by, you, know, you cannot detect just the field itself. The only way that you can detect it, you have to detect it through interactions. Like you have to measure the force acting on the other charge and on and on, right? You sort of got the idea. So that means the concept of the electric field is just the device for us to understand electric effects, right? However, this theory go beyond that. <laughs> there is more to it. And that's the topic of the discussion today. And we're going to discuss only this. When I say only this, because I mean, if I accomplish this and you guys understand what I'm talking about, I'm happy, right? That's it. That's what I want to do. All right. So what we are going to learn today is called Gauss's law. And the key to understand Gauss's law, there are two things. The first thing, and I think this is the, the key ingredient to this Gauss's law is how to, or how to sort of like, you know, calculate or have to understand what is electric flux first. That's the first thing. Once you understand what the flux is, then the Gauss's law seems to be an easy one because it's just like an like a extension to what it means by flux, okay? And we just apply the concept of flux in the context of electricity, okay? Sounds like a good plan? Okay, so the first half of the lecture, I will just spend time talking about flux. <laughs> and hopefully by the end of the first half, then I will can sort of like take you guys to the conclusion of this, like, okay, you know what the flux is, then this is Gauss's law. And once we're done with that, they will take a look at the application. And the main application of this one is you will be able to calculate the capacitance of a capacitor. So I will introduce what the capacitor is and then how can the Gauss's law allow you to calculate the property of those capacitors. Okay, sounds like a good plan. Okay, so let's see how far can we go. <laughs> I don't know how far can we go. All right, but just let me know if you got stuck at some place because I will call this one pretty new in comparison to everything else that you have done so far. Here we go. Look on the right, guys. This is electric field lines, correct? We discussed before that if you are look at the location where the density of lines is high, okay, you sort of follow my logic a little bit here. If the density of line is high, that means the electric field magnitude is high as well. So that means the location where the electric field lines is very dense, it will represent a strong electric field. That makes sense? Agree with that? Okay. Okay. So that means the lines per unit area, number of lines per area should tell you the strength of the electric field. Does that sort of like okay with that? Wow. There's, no, there's no wow, 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 or anything. It's not wow, it's just definition. Okay, so far, so good. <laughs> okay. All right, so what we have over here is that the number of lines per area will give you the strength of the electric field. But we just want to make it simple. I'm just going to turn this into equality. Why not? Without introducing any constant to it. So at this point, what I am talking about is, is going to look like this. The strength of the electric field equal to the number of lines. 
the numbers of lines. So let me sort of use the notation, the capital phi for that, the number of lines, and then divided by the area, and that's it, okay? This is flux. That's it. Done, guys. <laughs> okay? So the lines that we have been drawing so far, if you can count them, that will be electric flux. Now here comes the thing. How can you count them because it's not real, right? This equation will give you an idea because you can go back to the number of flux by taking the electric field from the Coulomb's law, multiply back the area, you will get the number of flux this way. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so sort of like, okay, now at least you derive this from Coulomb's law. You have KQ over R, for example, just an idea. And then you multiply by the area somewhere. You want to have like a circle, a square, a rectangle, doesn't matter. Then you will get the number of few lines. Okay. However, there is a problem with this. Because the flux is related to the electric field lines. But electric field is a vector quantity. So now here comes the question, guys. Is area a scalar quantity or a vector quantity? What do you think? Area. What do you think? In the past, I think you probably have learned that area is just an area, right? But in reality, if you talk about area, it has some orientation. So let me take this box as an example right here. So if you look at the surface of this box, I can put my pen up there just to show you what it is. So if you look on the side, see? So that's what happened. If you look on the side, your orientation is vertical, of course. If you put this one flat, so of course, I mean, orientation is going to be sort of like the face of, the, of this surface will be up. You can face it towards you, away from you, doesn't matter. So not only the area will give you the size of this area, the width times the length, you need the ability to tell us the orientation of this surface as well. So the conclusion I'm going to make right here is we're going to turn this, when I say turn this, because you might took area to be scalar before, but today we're going to call this is a vector quantity. Now your area is a vector. Why do we need this? The reason is because look at this figure one more time, guys. The good thing about this figure is the line piercing through this area perpendicularly. So it seems to make sense. Like, okay, then I can count the number of lines, like one, two, three, four, five. I mean, reference to this figure doesn't mean that the actual electric field will have this much or this many lines. But just saying that, just take this as an example, we can just count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, it looks fine. However, if you look at this, next page. If the area is tilted a little bit, how would you count lines that piercing through the area? Does that make sense to you? There must be some sort of like a, a, a constraint or some relationship or whatever, the relation between the direction of the line and the orientation of the surface that you need to take into account before you can count, is this line going through the surface or not? Now, I'll give you one simple example right here. If you imagine this electric field line to be a raindrop, <laughs> it's like it's raining right now, okay? And then you have a piece of paper, just that blue area over there, and then you have that area just sitting flat. Of course, the whole surface, it will receive the raindrop, I mean, the rain will fall onto this surface, no problem, right? But then you can imagine if you flip this surface vertically, oh, it's supposed to be black. So if you flip this vertically, you probably will agree with me that, Ajahn, there will be no rain falling on this surface anymore. Does that make sense to you? Yeah? So if the area is somewhere in between tilted, the amount of rain dropping onto this surface will be different, depends on the angle. And you can see if you define the angle just like the one that you see in green over here, 
you will get no rain when the theta is at 90 degrees. Does that make sense? And you will get the maximum amount of raindrop on it when it's at zero degree. So the orientation of the surface relative to the orientation or the direction of the field lines will determine the amount of field line or the flux that is going to piercing through, I will call it piercing through or go through or fall on that surface. That's the key that we want to be able to calculate that. And then now you say, about Ajahn, it's maximum when it's zero, it's minimum when it's 90. What kind of function you think of is the cosine function right there. Because cosine goes to zero when theta is 90, and it's maximum when it's at zero. So I can define this properly between the electric field and the area by turning, it, <laughs> by turning this equation back into some sort of like a vector operation. Can you sort of come up with the idea what kind of operation that we can sort of like, you know, write from this E times A cosine it? Does it ring any bell? You used this before. Something times something, and then you have the cosine of the angle between the two. And that is correct. Okay. So it's the work, right? Back in the day, you have work equal to F dot S. And you say is an F times the S magnitude and the cosine of the angle between the two. So the answer is you need the dot product between the two vector. So that means I should be able to write this equation, the flux, to be something of E dot with the something of A. Does that make sense to you now? <laughs> okay, now here comes the only problem we have left is how can we define the area vector right here? to make it correspond to what we want right now at this point. Conclusion is this. So what we want to do is we are going to define the area vector. Here we go. We put like, let me emphasize this. I put an arrow on top of the A now. So your area vector will be, of course, the magnitude is just the width times the length as usual. But now you add the directional vector to it. And this one, we use the word N with the hat. Every time you use the hat, mean that is the units vector, right? So it's no big deal, like I, J, K, R that we have seen before. Now we have the N. N is for normal again, guys. That is for normal. So what it means is whenever you see a surface, look on the right. You have an area A, width times height, no big deal. But if you look at this one, what you need to do is just you draw a vector perpendicular to the surface. That is your area vector. You guys with me? Okay. Okay, once again, right here. This will be cool. So every time from now on that you see a surface, you draw a vector perpendicular to that surface. That vector will be the direction of the area vector. Come back here. Over here, if you want an area vector, just put perpendicular to it, okay? Back here, you want an area vector, you do perpendicular to it. Every time, all the time. Over here, you put a perpendicular vector to it, see? So the, I think the easiest way to imagine the area vector, the direction of the area vector, is looking at your hairs on your body. <laughs> Of course, like when you see a ghost or whatever, then your hair stands up. When your hair stand up, that is your area vector. <laughs> That's right here. The area vector of your skin and all that stuff like that. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. So, I mean, of course, you have to put your hair up too, right? Just to make it like stand up, everything. So, that's the direction of the area vector. So, come back here again. So, this is my surface right here. So, if I say, hey, Ajahn, I want a vector of this area. You have to imagine that you have a vector attached to this. If you look on the side, it might be a little bit clearer. So that's what it is. Or oh, maybe it's too big. So that's right there. There you go. <laughs> it's still too big anyway. <laughs> All right, right there. Oh, okay. This one has some color. All right, so ready you go. So you can imagine that this area vector just sort of like go along with it. 
wherever your orientation goes. Okay? Okay. Now, there is one more problem though. But then wait a second. Why don't you draw the other direction? You said you want perpendicular. Why you have to point in that direction? Why you don't why don't you point into the opposite direction? Yeah? Like over here, but then why don't you point it down? Over here, why don't you point it downward like that? So that's a real problem. If you think about this, then you sort of like, okay, I agree with you. That is a problem. If this surface is an open surface, what you're looking at over here, we call it an open surface because it's just a flat piece of paper. Let's think a bit about it that way. So you have two sides of this area. So that's why you can define two directions to your area vector. But what we are going to do next, we will deal with just only a closed surface. So you don't have to worry about it at this point. So I'll give you the conclusion a little bit later, what will happen to the actual direction that we're going to use. Okay, but for now, let's focus on the perpendicular direction of the area vector to the actual surface area. Okay, so with this definition of the area vector, what you get over here is now, I can just draw the relationship between the E dot with the A is going to be the flux that you want, just like what we need. Okay, so let's test your understanding a little bit here, guys. Let's look side view over here. So if you have an electric field point from left to right, piercing through a surface that lie with some angle to this field. First thing that you need to do is, of course, you have to draw a vector perpendicular to the actual surface. You guys with me? That is the normal direction to the surface. So your area vector will point in this direction as well. So let me put like a big one. Okay, why don't we do this? Sorry, let me put a small one here for the, for the mini end here. So that, that's your mini end over there. And then your actual surface area will be like a big one, right? Because you have to multiply by the actual area of it. So that is your area vector. Now, when you look at this one, all you need to look at is the angle between the E, electric field vector, and the A, area vector. If that angle is theta, as showing right here, the flux that going through this surface is going to be E dot with the A, which is E A cosine theta, correct? So far so good? Okay. okay. All right, this is done. Now, you already familiar with this kind of operation. What if I do this? I just gonna put the cosine theta next to the E and multiply by A. How would you interpret this way of writing? You might be able to think of this by RTA Ajahn. What you're doing over here is you take E and you only need the cosine theta components of the E, right? So it's just like you have an E vector and then you do the vector component. This E cosine theta. You guys with me now? So this is the same idea as what you did with the work equal to the F dot displacement. You only need the force that is pointing in the same direction as the displacement for your calculation of the work. Same thing over here. All you need is just the electric field component that is pointing in the same direction as the area vector. Why we want that? Because we already defined the area vector to be perpendicular to the actual surface, right? By taking only the components of the electric field that is perpendicular, I'm sorry, one more time. If I taking just only the components of the electric field that is parallel to the A is the guarantee that you only take the electric field components that actually perpendicular to the real surface. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So the parallel components between the E and the A is guarantee the perpendicular between, I think it's a perpendicularity. <laughs> said the word. Okay. It's the guarantee that you only take into account the component of the electric field that point perpendicular to the real surface. 
okay, it sounds confusing at first because it's like, you know, you have to flip your head 90 degree all the time. But this make vector equation a lot more easier because you can utilize the dot product. Now, all you need is just taking the components of the electric field that is parallel to the area vector to guarantee that that's the only thing that you need when you would like to calculate the flux through that surface. I don't know that. Uh, give me a sign if this is not bad or is this bad or <laughs> okay one more one more one more shot one more comparison here i can actually keep that cosine with the a so what does this means it means instead of breaking the e into two components you leave the e alone all right so i say i don't want to deal with the electric field what i can do is i can feel it's not a feeling but what you can do is is feel like you can actually do the same thing with the A. If you take A cosine theta, what do you get? Look at the blue. It's like you would like to take the A vector component that is parallel to the E. That is your A cosine theta. You guys, be so there are two ways that you can think about this because it's a dots product. So you can say is the direction of one vector in the other direction direction. So that means you can do the other way around. You can take only the component of E that point in the same direction as A, or you can take the component of A that points in the direction of E. Same thing. It's a product. You can do either way. All right. So what it means over here is you only take a portion of your area which is sounds really weird, right? A portion of an area doesn't make sense. But because now we define A to be a vector now, when you say you have only this component, okay, stay with me here. I only take this portion of my area. But remember, the definition of the area is the real area is going to be perpendicular to the vector, right? This A cosine theta will represent this area. You guys with me? I don't know. This is going to be the, I think this is the, the, the most complicated part to understand now. Okay. The actual area A is here. It's sort of like diagonal. Okay. But what we take, we only take A cosine theta, which is already point to your right horizontally. So this must means that the actual area that you are talking about must be perpendicular to it. So let me highlight this one. There you go. Yes. That blue shaded area that I just drew, that is A cosine theta. But it's the same thing as when you look at the black area that is tilted a little bit, you only take this portion of it into account which is going to be the same. These two are the same, same. And this one is A cosine theta. Does that make sense? I don't know, does that make sense to you or not? Oh, there's a question, what's the point of this? <laughs> All right, very soon, very soon. All right, very soon. All right, but I just want you to understand the mathematics behind this first. Otherwise then sort of like things will go too crazy. All right, look at the figure on the right. I hope my explanation helps explaining what is going on on the right. Okay, look at the first figure on the top. All right, you have electric field point horizontally. You have an area that is tilted a little bit. Now we know how to draw an area vector, but all you care about is only the components of the electric field that point in the same direction as the electric field. I'm sorry, that points in the same direction as the area vector. So that's what you do over here. Does that make sense? Or you can think the other way around. You can think of it like you take the A and then you A only bring in the components that is perpendicular to E, one way or the other. Pick one. you will get the same result. But the good thing about the, I mean, not a good thing, but the things that follow from 
breaking A into two components is if you look at the horizontal components over here, it will represent the area that is perpendicular to it, which is just the one that has got to be oriented upright, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there's a question coming in. Is this complicated thing for measuring electric field relative to a plane A? Yes, that's exactly what it is. What we're trying to cap, sort of like to catch, to capture is how much electric field is actually piercing through a surface or an area. But you have to take into account the orientation of the area. Okay, all right. Otherwise then, well, you don't have a quantitative analysis of this electric field line. And this is how it's done. Okay, let's look at some example. It will help, I hope. Okay, let's look at this. Now, what we are about to do next, as I said, we, we will only deal with a closed surface. So that means we're not going to have like an open surface, like a, like a piece of paper, no. You're going to have a surface that wrap on itself in all directions. So what you are looking at in general is going to look like a balloon. So it means the surface will wrap on itself and it will eventually enclose a volume. That surface will eventually enclose, encloses a volume. You will have an internal volume to this surface all the time. So you can imagine that a box like this. I use this box here. So as you can see, it's the closed surface because you have all the surface and so you build up a box shape over here. So the surface is closed on itself. This is a closed surface. And of course, you have an internal volume inside this box. Okay. So when you say you have an internal stuff within this surface, then there must be an external to it. So this is a good thing is every time that you have a closed surface, you have an in and out. You have a direction associated with it. You can call something is go inside this volume or you want something leaking out. So if you have this kind of surface, your area vector is unique. We agree that we're going to take the area vector to point outward from the internal volume. Okay, guys, make sense? Okay, look at this bubble, for example. Okay, it's closed. The surface is closed. So if you look at a portion of the surface and you want to know, hey, Ajahn, what is the direction of the area vector? You will say, well, okay, you just draw a vector that point perpendicular to it, and that will be your A vector pointing outward. So there will be no ambiguity. What's out, what's not? I mean, what is the other direction? I don't care. You only take the area vector that is pointing outward from the enclosed volume. Okay, make sense? Does that help? Okay. And now when you have a closed surface, now you have an internal volume. The dot product that happens between the electric field vector E and the A will eventually give you all the possibility of the final result. When I say all the possibility, what does it mean? Whenever E, A cosine theta, and when the theta is still between zero, oops, sorry. When the theta is still between zero and 90 degree, this E A cosine theta will be greater than zero. You guys with me here? It's positive. And then you will, you will have the opposite case on the back. Okay, look at this one. If you look at the surface number three, the area vector will point somewhere backward, a little bit backward, in comparison to the electric field that points from left to right. So in this case, what you have is the theta is greater than 90 degree. Oh, not equal. All right, I don't want equal. Okay, 90. But of course, you don't want to go beyond 180 because if you go beyond 180, you can go the opposite direction and count everything. So nothing will go beyond 180 anyway. But from that, what you get for the E A cosine theta, you're going to get a negative number. You guys with me? All right. And then you will end up with that at some like the, the boundary, the boundary between the two 
is when the area vector is just sit perfectly perpendicular to the electric field line. That means when the theta is 90 degree. And that's when E A cosine theta is perfectly equal to zero. But that makes sense because this is the case that we would discuss when you have like a rainfall on a paper that actually sit perpendicularly. This is the same thing. You can see that electric field line does not penetrate the area. Does that make sense to you? It's only glance through the area, but it doesn't really penetrate the area. So that's why in this 90 degree condition, there is no flux going through the surface. So this figure try to conclude all three possibility. Flux can be positive, can be negative, or it can be zero because it just came from the dot product, right? But look carefully on this one, guys. Do you feel something here now? When you have a positive flux, it's just telling you that the A and the E seem to go along. That's when you get positive flux. When you say it's go along means electric field is going out because we already defined the area to be outward from the enclosed volume, right? So that means every time you have positive flux, mean the electric field is out. So let me call this an out flux. Does that make sense? It's an out flux. The electric field is trying to leaking out from the enclosed volume. On the left, of course, things will go opposite. In this case, it's a negative flux. So it seems like this is an influx. Electric field try to get in, try to enter the enclosed volume. And of course, when the flux is zero, this give nothing. There's no in, there's no out. It just doesn't deal with anything at all. And now I hope you understand what the flux means now. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Whew, maybe. I hope. <laughs> no, maybe not. <laughs> we'll just like put some effect here. Okay, one more time. Instead of thinking about this as an electric field, what if you think about this as a water flow? All right, you imagine this orange lines over here. Think of it like a lamina for flow, like you, like you treat it in fluid dynamics before. And this balloon, you can think of it like a, you have like a, 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 well, you can think of it like a, a reservoir or you can think of it like a room or you can think of it like a, a, a void or a space, whatever, that's inside this water flow. There is a stream of water flowing. So you kind of understand what the flux trying to tell you now. It will tell you how much water is coming in and out from this volume right here. Does that make sense? So that means if those blue, I'm sorry, orange, I'm sorry, wrong color. If those orange lines representing a flow of water, the flux will tell you how much water is going out from the volume that you are looking at and how much water is flowing in. Whoa, 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 whoa. With me? Oh, maybe I have circle flux. If the net flux of in and out is just perfectly matched, the amount of water in your volume in this bubble over here will not change. So that's a good concept about flux. It will be eventually tells you the change or whatever the quantity that's in and out. You try to net. You try to come up with like the final result between in and out. Okay, one more example. If you imagine these orange lines to be a heat flow, whoa, we learned about heat before. But if we imagine that there is a flow of heat, now you can name this like a heat flux. And this bubble over here could be like, I don't know, once again, you could be your room, for example. So you can calculate the outflow of the heat and the inflow of the heat by calculating the heat flux. And the net flux will be able to sort of like allow you to calculate like, hey, your room will get hotter or not if net flux is in 
or your room will be cooler if the net flux is out. Something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, makes sense. All right, so what you have over here is you can use these concepts of flux everywhere. You can use it in fluid dynamics. You can use it in heat equations. You can use it over here in electric fields. You can use it in a magnetic field later. You can use it anywhere that there is a field and you would like to calculate in and out. When you want to know within your volume, what would you like? Okay. There's a comment from your friends like it would be easier to understand with 2D circle. I would say no. The reason I have to go sort of like torture you guys with the three-dimensional stuff because in 2D, you won't have a closed surface. I cannot do it. You need a three-dimensional closed surface to wrap around this. So that's why I cannot deduce this thing down to 2D. Yeah, does that make sense? No, but the field can just be just one dimensional, right? Right, but that will make it even harder because to imagine your field to be in one dimensional, then now you're going to stuck with another question of turning things down into 2D and then you have to reduce the E into, you know? All right. Is if you want to cry. <laughs> okay, don't worry. All right, don't have to cry right now. So what I want, <laughs> we will sort of do some examples together after the break. But I hope by the end of today's lecture, you will feel more comfortable with the flux calculation. Right? Even though it sounds tedious, it sounds crazy and all this stuff, but I hope at the end, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. But what you're doing right now is, once again, I would like to revoke this name again, is the vector calculus that you're dealing with right now. Okay. Yes. Question. Okay. All right. I think, okay, that's a good point. Uh, before your question, just for the rest of the class, you'll know that, okay, I think this is a good point to break. Sounds like a good plan. Sure. <laughs> and then we'll show you how to calculate this flux of crazy stuff after the break, guys. Okay. All right. Okay. Question, please. Yes. Do uh, your flux usually resolving zero because the object is chemical? The object is chemistry. Come again? I mean, if, you, come, come if the on. object is perfectly equal sphere or cube. A sphere or cube. Yeah. Okay. Will the flux be zero? Ah, that depends on the field. Depends on the field. Correct. Because mm -hmm. to determine the amount of flux, the key thing is the field. And then you look at the fields going through those surfaces. Like then the field you'll be able to determine, eventually you will get zero flux or more flux or less flux. I mean, positive net or negative net or zero hmm. net flux. Wait, the field, your field is just case line. All right. Direction. Um, it depends on the direction of the field. For example, what we are going to show you after the break is the scenario. For example, over here, see, uh, I can show you, for example, this one right here. If you have like a simple uniform field point from simple left to uniform. right, and you have a box, then you can see sure. that, oh, John, this is left in, right out. In seems to be equal to out. So net flux should be zero, something like that. Does mm. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But now if you look at the first one, well, Adan, this is, no, nah, there's only out. There's no in, right? This oh. one, you should have a positive flux because there's no in to counter the out. So the net flux in this case should be zero. I'm mean, sorry, it should be positive, something like that. So that's why I'm saying it depends on the direction of the field. And then from that, then you determine the net flux. But like uh, every flux guy canceling out its order. In like a, for example, yeah, you have every opposite direction. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, if you have something in opposite direction, then you have a cancellation effect. Yes, eventually you mm -hmm. may have no chain. I mean, no flux. Net zero flux, I would say. I see. Okay. All right. Well, it will be a little bit better after the exercises. I think we'll go through here, some calculation over here, and then I think you'll feel a little bit better. <laughs> right now, it's like abstract and all this stuff. Okay, guys, take a break, and we'll sort of show you more after the break. Sounds good? All right. So see you in 10. Yeah.